if there's any piece of Tudor fashion that has truly become iconic, it's the French hood. There's just something about this strange little head covering that just sparks mad devotion across the world. Maybe it's because it's so linked with Anne Boleyn. Uh, maybe it carries this sort of unconscious association with the fantasy of being a royal princess. Maybe it's just the right amount of exotic and strange while also being recognisable. Uh, in any case, whether a TV or a movie or a play or blah, 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 is set in the Tudor world, they're going to try experimenting with reproducing this particularly memorable bit of women's fashion. And boy oh boy do costume departments really not know what to do. So let's break down how French hoods developed, how we think they might have been constructed, and how they've ended up as sparkly headbands from Claire's accessories. Women in the 15th century wore elaborate wired headdresses and hats, what we would associate with the archetypal princess comb. You have your long pointies, you have your wides, you have your little straight up henins, but from the 14th centuries onwards, we start to see these headdresses evolve into a very distinctive shape, particularly in France and Burgundy. The front look, which are these bands of black silk that are long and wide and they hang down the back, they start to become the centre focus of these headdresses. And by the 1490s, this type of head covering has taken over entirely. You're not going to be seeing hennins and cones anyway, you've now got the frontlet. And this begins its process of evolution into a hood. These first stage evolutions of the French hood are constructed in layers. It starts with a template, which is a fabric base worn around the head. Then there's another layer of stiff linen and then the frontlet, which is a band of black silk from the crown all the way down to the shoulder. A veil is worn at the back to conceal the hair, but on top of that, it is pretty customisable. Whatever decorations you want, whatever embroidery, whatever jewellery, whatever gold, whatever you want to make it eye-catching, flashy, wealthy, fashionable, whatever you want, you got it. With the particular layers established, the hood starts to take on regional styles. It's important to remember that fashion is not universal in this period and where you live, what court you're in, what alliances your country has is going to dictate what style of fashion you're going to wear. So Spain, France, Burgundy, the hood becomes rounder. It fits closer to the head and it rises up away from the face. In England, the shaping wires take on a sort of triangular pediment shape and that starts into the gable hood, which is a particularly English form of headdress. It's not until the 1520s, nearly 50 years later after it first started, that we see the classique French hood, crescent-shaped, fitting close to the head, tucked up by the ears. Now, the French hood remains in fashion until around the 1560s on the continent, but it continues being a wardrobe staple throughout the century in England. We even have a further regional variation, the English hood, which has a flattened crown and a sharper angle around the ears. The French hood is, is essentially a hat of many layers worn near the back of the head with a fabric veil attached. I mean, that, that's the simple answer. Um, it's difficult to truly know the exact ins and outs of a French hood because we don't have any. No French hoods have survived into the present day. They were long picked apart to be used for other items and milliners of the period didn't leave patterns and clear instructions on how to make them. That's not uncommon. It's not a, a grand hat-based conspiracy. There are plenty of everyday items from various periods of history that are difficult for us to recreate with a high degree of accuracy because people didn't feel the need to write down and record things they interacted with on an everyday basis because, you know, everyone knows that. 
So this has led to um, a high amount of contention around how exactly a French hood was constructed and how it should sit on the head with reenactors, historians, costumiers, fashion experts. They all have slightly differing opinions and theories on how to make the most accurate hood. And take these for example. So these two wires were found by mudlarkers in the River Thames. They're on display at the Museum of London and it's claimed they are the only surviving pieces of hoods that have ever been discovered and have ever lasted to the modern day. So they're the frames presumably that would hold their shape. Maybe. Who knows? Others argue as equally passionately that these come from a different style of headdress. Um, one based in the Netherlands that's nothing like a hood but as we don't have anything else to compare it's hard to definitely say whether they are or whether they aren't or whether they were maybe used for that style of headdress but someone repurposed them for a French hood or even that they were originally from a French hood and then repurposed for that. Like, we just don't know. We, we also don't know quite how the layers go together whether they were attached together as a permanent piece like a like a hat or were they just pinned together or you know were they ties hook and eyes who knows i am not going to go into that debate because someone is going to shout at me instead we're going to look at this portrait of elizabeth seymour and discuss the five main elements of the french hood the first layer is the coif. This is a linen cap that's worn to cover and contain the hair. So it protects the rest of the layers of the hood from the effects of grease and oil from your hair. You can wash a coif. Throwing a velvet headdress studded with jewels into the wash basket, it's, it's a little bit more difficult. Then comes the clopine. This is a pleated or gathered head covering over the coif and it forms that very distinctive frill you see around the edges. The crescent shape on the hood is the paste and that forms the contrasting colour from other elements around it. This is perhaps the part that is most contentious. The shape of it, the round shape of that crescent shape, it actually creates an optical illusion when painted from the sides or head on in paintings, which look makes it look like it lifts from the head as if these women have just taken a golf visor and just stuck it straight on there. Images from the 16th century of women in profile show that the hood is flat with the top of the head. It is flat, 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 usually. I do say usually. There are some examples of hoods that appear to have height to them. Whether this is a regional thing or personal style, who knows? It's hard to tell. You know, Anne Boleyn wasn't running a fashion blog. I can't ask her, you know, how doth ladies wear their hoods this year? And then the veil. This is the hood part, which is designed to cover and hide the hair. This is pretty much always black, hanging down in a straight fall and made from wool, satin or silk velvet. Once that's in place, it's time to decorate. The borders along the upper and front edges are called the billamots and they feature jewels, gold work, pearls, whatever you can afford and isn't going to be so heavy as to cause your neck to start to list to the side. Not every layer seems to have been always included in the construction of a hood. It could be as a elaborate or as simple as custom or fancy dictated, matching the needs and personal style of the wearer. They were the ultimate customizable fashion accessory and it's why some form of the hood remained in fashion at the English court right up until the end of Elizabeth's reign. They're customizable, easily changed and will always fit the needs of the wearer. No, okay. So making a French hood has certain challenges. We don't have surviving examples. The shape and the layering isn't always apparent in contemporary images. Add in the demands of production to not make actresses look too weird and keep them like sexy and attractive for modern standards, as well as pressures of time, budget, ability to research about the period. 
nitpicking from assholes like me. I don't want to blame costuming departments for slipping up when they're overstretched, undervalued and underpaid. That said, there are definitely some interpretations that are pretty friggin' hilarious and we're gonna have a good laugh about them. I'm so sorry, Mary. If I'd known the kind of guests the event would draw, I would have cancelled the tasting. It's not your fault. Rumours of our distance are spreading. The timing of the event is terrible. I don't think time would change much for us, Francis. Yes, well, that is where you and I disagree. Not the only place. Conde. Does it not strike you as unfair that I am forbidden to live my life the way I desire? Don't speak to me of your desire for another. My desire to put the horrors of my past behind me. I mean, I appreciate that they, that they just didn't try. They went for a really specific costuming style. Wish.com slash prom night. There's head necklaces, puffy headbands and loose hair aplenty. It's a pseudo historical contemporary fashion mix that the very young viewers can put on Twitter or Pinterest and track the items and buy them in real life. Like it meets the target demographic, you know, fair dues. The costume designers had a particular style. They met it, it was fine. I can't judge, I'm not going to judge them on that. They, they had a tick list, they met their tick list. It's not mine, but it's fine. It's, 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 it, it is what it is. Also offer me up to this royal bull. You my father and you my mother. For God's sake, lower your voice. Do you know what it is to be in love, either of you? I love Harry Percy and will marry him. Anne, you'll have us all dead or disgraced, lower your voice. The royal bull can't force you. Brother, I must fight, I must. You know what it means when a king asks for you. If I don't, I can ask my pregnant and foolish sister. If you turn him away, we can say farewell to all we've worked for and all we have. Anne, if our parents had not taken an advantage when it came their way, what would have become of us? If we lose the king's favour, we lose everything. Then say goodbye to it all, house, rank and revenues, for I will not take the king to my bed. Your Majesty. Oof. I am caught in controversy today. Yes, Genevieve Bourgeois is the best actress to portray Anne Boleyn, don't come for me, and yes, the costumes are phenomenal. The, 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 19, the 1960s and 1950s and 1940s always had problems when doing period accurate fashion because they would include contemporary touches in what they made, like princess scenes, blah 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 blah. blah. This Anne of a Thousand Days mostly misses those problems. They're actually, in terms of shape and layer and fit, they're pretty accurate. But I mean, it's just an Alice band, a puffy decorated Alice band. I think I think I wore something like this to my first school disco when I was five. I had my name on it in glitter glue and you know, like little decorations and stuff. Her, her hair is loose because costume designers are wedded to this shorthand for showing that, you know, the woman's a free spirit and she's modern minded and she's not bound by convention, even though it always looks terrible because it doesn't match what they're wearing. Also check out the golf visor on Mummy Berlin too. And it's a shame because the general shape is it's pretty good for a theatrically made hood and there are many good examples of hoods in this film but I I am confused I am confused <laughs> yes <laughs> I hope you know what you're doing these are vagabonds who'll stop at nothing to take your money we're not gambling, Your Grace. Mrs. Berlin is reading our fortunes. Read mine. Another talent picked up in France. Ooh. I I'm being controversial again because I think the other Berlin girl, 2008, does contain some of the best examples of early 16th century costuming and hoods while also having some of the worst examples. So the, the costume designer for this film was Sandy Powell, who is a, you know, living legend, 
I worship. Uh, she is one of the finest working in the field, particularly in historical styles. You know, she has the range, darling. She has the range. Her research is painstaking, and you can see it on the screen. It just, it, it just works. You know, the hoods are impeccably designed and fitted. They're wonderfully constructed. They're opulently outfitted. And and then there's this one. Do you think you'll like me? Of course he will, sister. How could he not? Sir Thomas, your majesty, you're most welcome. Like, what is this? What is this headpiece they've crammed onto Natalie Portman's head? Not only that, what is this, this dress? It's got like Cranach sleeves. It's got like high German elements that don't mesh at all with English Renaissance style. And it just, it's like a sad little potato sack and then I just look at that hood and it's like how does this stay on what even is this the rest of the production is so good minus some stomacher issues here but what is this dress it smacks of someone making the decision that Anne has to look young and modest and out of step so that when she makes her debut at court later on, it's like a huge noticeable difference, you know, ye olde, she is all, she if doth all that. But like, this just feels mean. These shoes must be nicely put and always carefully attended. Yes, my lady. Your Majesty, the King is here. Oh, my. Sweetheart, there are two people come to be introduced to you. <sighs> Welcome, Elizabeth. This is my daughter, the Lady Elizabeth. Do I even need to say anything? I mean, I don't, I don't want to be mean to the costume designer because I don't think they gave them any money. But every costume on this show was so ludicrously ugly and just, I feel bad for the actresses having to wear cheap polyester for 16 hours a day and having a cardboard plate rammed on your head. Your father would be so proud. Your Grace, are you quite well? You seem a little pale. I am just tired. Oh, who can blame you? If valor is truly to be honored, it is you who should be knighted. I agree. Knight or woman? Maggie, you are a rebel. It is in my blood, or so they tell me. <laughs> Howard! I say... Howard, I've still got my cock. <laughs> Sorry, it's too much Philippa Gregory in one burst. Okay. Massage the pain away, Jess. Right, so this series is set up to 1520, which, as we well know, did not see women at the English court wearing French hoods. The French, the French hood, as we would call it, wasn't even around yet. But a gable hood would be too weird or whatever reason they pulled out their asses to avoid having to make them. So we get 16 episodes of terrible headbands with random shit glued on them. 
the hair is never covered up, there is nary a hairpin in sight, <laughs> and the costumes are both badly designed and ill-fitting. <laughs> Why spend so much money on talent and location if you're, you're just going to give up? with the look it's just giving up just whatever just put them in something that seems vaguely historic you know it's a design aesthetic that reminds me of my princess rapunzel barbie like it's princessy enough uh princess huh when was it you last saw one another hey Since we seek some alliances via marriage, I thought she should come back to court. Remind the world that it's not just the king's sisters that carry the royal line. And she's a good girl, really. If you think more of what others may like to hear rather than what you want to say, a husband would be lucky to have you. You were always so keen to prove that our positions in this world were alike. And here we are, both put out for sale at the same time. Props to this costume team for working with the Tudor tailor on creating a late 1540s wardrobe. Some of the outfits, the recreations they've done of famous portraits are so spot on. They're just absolutely astounding. There is a great deal of detail and care on display in the costuming. The, the conical shapes of the bodices are really spot on. There's layering. There's a great organic feel to the costumes as they have individualised elements that really work to show how they conform to both particular style but the personal flares of taste as per the character. I mean, I, I don't like the mindset of like, we want to appeal to modern audiences so Elizabeth's an emo teen and Catherine Parr's bohemian and they have lots of bits with their hair down and some hunting jodhpurs which may or may not be accurate but I understand you have to appeal to not me. I also think that the, sh the shaping of the hoods are really well done. They have a beautiful realness to them that you could unpick them and see the layers of construction and you know, the weight and how they're made but I do think they stick up too high. I, I just I just think that they are it kind of makes them seem a little bit ludicrous, a little bit golf visory. I also don't like that they had to cast a 30 year old actress to play Elizabeth because they were going to have 13 year old Elizabeth in a consensual sexual relationship with a 40 year old man. And they couldn't cast a teen actress to play the part otherwise because that would look disgusting and rapey and they're trying to make it appear romantic. Let, let, let's just move on. Did you have a chance to speak with the king regarding the monasteries? I'm putting together a detailed plan to put before parliament, but an expedient approval from the king would be appreciated by all. <laughs> <laughs> He has been rather preoccupied of late. <laughs> Your Grace? Yes, yes, Cromwell, I spoke to him. <laughs> Very good. There are interesting things about the costume design for this show. For a start, it's a Channel 5 production, so you know, there's not money there. They are trying, they are trying and they do some interesting things, hence why they commission this show. So the, the budget will have been minuscule, really, really tiny. There was not a fart's chance in a hurricane of the production team making top class 1536 costumes. They also were given five weeks to do, <laughs> to do everything in the middle of COVID. In that they created a wide array of costumes, it was actually pretty impressive. They designed a very stylized version of the 1530 silhouette that could be mixed and matched across the production while giving a 
very, very, very basic silhouette. I mean, and they modernised it, of course, because it means they can skimp on the details and don't have to waste that five weeks on research because they need to be making them now and getting them fitted now. And, and you can tell where they've had to make, you know, cost saving or time saving measures, um, especially on the stomachers. For a start, the 1530s gown shouldn't have a stomach on. And they're all, they've all got poppers on and they all, like, they stick and puff up. That's... I think this was because the lead actress, um, I think she said she was breastfeeding at the time and she needed to be able to get in and out of the gown and in and out of the costume quickly to feed her child. Although why that meant stomachers, I don't know, because Tudor gowns of the period fastened down the side because surprise surprise Tudor women also breastfed but you know whatever they fit a very generalized idea of what someone might remember a Tudor gown looking like from a textbook they saw like 10 or 15 years ago at school again these costumes are not made for me they're made for other people and they would be fine now the, the French hoods the hoods why we're here again Tying into all of that, they are not designed to be accurate French hoods. They would have not been able to do them so many so quickly in such a short time span. And this is an Anne Boleyn with Afro textured hair and the headpieces have been designed to uh, accentuate and complement her natural hair. That doesn't mean I particularly like how they interpreted them but the hood works in terms of making sense within the universe of this show like with rain there is a specific visual effect and style and meaning that they're going with that is at least internally cohesive and has thought behind it and I can respect that I can respect what they were trying to achieve, even if I don't particularly like it. Incredibly, this game of cards actually happened. Catherine and Anne and Henry sat down to play cards. Now, the atmosphere must have been toxic. Catherine shooting looks of pure hatred at Anne. Henry probably enjoying the whole thing. And as for Anne herself, well, she certainly enjoyed a challenge. version of history who made this why was this made what the fuck is that baby i'm looking at this script like it's the da vinci code or some shit i don't even know what is on this paper historical flea tudor flea bag uh uh and for the hoods they, they grabbed some tinsel and some padded headbands and then they were like yep that, that's fine just roll this over your head i guess just i just shame shame on everyone who decided to make this mccoy don't let him out Lady Anne.
Vous êtes gentil, hein Alors, Master Cremuel. We can all agree that Wolf Hall has some of the single best Henrician costuming that you're ever likely to see. Like, the, there is so much care, it is so exquisite, there is so much love for what makes fashion at this time period so unique and strange to modernise, but beautiful and practical and lived in and the class differences that you can visualise between the women just between how they wear certain things, what fabrics they have access to and how their dresses are constructed to meet the needs of their lives. If you, I have a strong belief that if you were to take these costumes, you take them, go back in time to Henry VIII's court and I don't think that they would be able to tell the difference. And yet, and yet with all that time and effort and money and research and correct fabrics and cutting techniques and sewing techniques and knowing that every stitch was accurate to the period and the social class and what could be found and used. And again, the French hoods are just cheap headbands with shit glued on them. Why? Why go to all that effort and make side lacing gowns like those beautiful side lacing gowns. And then you, you take Claire Foy and you're like, here's a one pound plastic headband from Asta with some lace that we glued on. Yay! The hoods all have sheer veils. Which makes absolutely no goddamn sense because that's there to hide your hair from sight. And it makes it clear that none of them are wearing coifs even though there are some scenes where people, where women are wearing linen headcaps and I'm going, well, why aren't, why isn't everyone wearing a linen headcap? And then there's it's just these plastic headbands with pathetic strips of lace or embroidery and whatever's in the button box just hot glued on there. Was this, was this the day of the ball challenge, the Tudor ball challenge on RuPaul's Drag Race and you spent so long constructing the gown, you had to like grab everything at the last five minutes just so that you could have a headpiece to meet the needs of the challenge? I, I don't understand. I, I don't understand how everything can be so accurate and meticulous and then they went with this. The king is awake. Close the door. Henry? Stop in. Joan. Here is a secret. The reason why I wanted to do this video is so that I can gush about this image. I just look at that hood. It's perfect. This French hood is perfect. It is one of the, not one of the, it is the best depiction of a hood I've ever seen on screen. All the layers are in evidence. It sits flush with the top of the head. It is flat it's not a golf visor she is not summoning the all mother from the stars it has a solid black veil it even has a chin strap oh look how beautiful that is why did it take so long to actually get it right there was a, a second ulterior motive 
in me wanting to make a video about a French hood because if you're still watching this video you're probably like me you may have had dreams of wearing your very own French hood wandering the streets of London town walking through Hampton Court going to Asda to buy a pot noodle but you're in full Henrician court dress well the Tudor Taylor were having sales on kits of French hoods, making French hood kits so I got one and I'm going to be making one for the channel and showing off my own French hood and whether or not I can actually make this because I have just spent a long time complaining about very professional and hard-working costume designers who have far more experience and talent than me and you know I'm gonna put my money where my mouth is can I do it? Can I make a good looking French hood that I would approve of? So I'm going to be doing that over the next coming weeks. So I guess stick around, like, share, subscribes. If, if you have a French hood, if, if you like complaining about French hoods, if you want to laugh with me <laughs> at some of these costuming disasters then you know stick around and stuff i will see you on the flip side